Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Leanne. If I haven't met you, I'm the worship pastor here at Redeemer Church, and it's truly a joy to worship with you every single week. I tell Adam all the time, it's my, it's my favorite day of the week, and it happens again in seven days. So we'll see you again in seven days. A special welcome to everyone joining us online or on demand later in the week. We know it's fall break, and we hope you tune in at some point this week. Um, Today, we're starting a new series on the subject of prayer, specifically the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to be in Matthew 6. If you want to get your Bible ready, um, I'll be using the NIV version. This sermon is for anyone who may be dissatisfied with your prayer life. If you've ever seen it more as a duty than a delight, or if you feel guilty about not praying enough, or if you've ever felt confused about how to pray or if prayer even works, This sermon is for you. It's for us. There's this strange thing about us. To be human is to pray. In other words, in great moments of fear or guilt or sadness or joy, we often speak to someone or something beyond ourselves. We cannot help it because to be human is to pray. And yet we wonder, is it so complicated? Are there rules? Am I doing it right? And Jesus gives us direction on this subject in the book of Matthew. In the middle of the greatest sermon ever delivered, he gives us the greatest prayer ever prayed. But he starts with some warnings. So let's start there. In Matthew 6, verse 5, Jesus says, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward in full. So even prayer is one of these things that if you get really good at it, you tend to show off. I guess pastors are especially vulnerable to this since we're always praying in public. Um, Pastor peer pressure syndrome, I call it. Sometimes when I'm with a group of people and someone else is praying, and I know it's going to be my turn soon, instead of praying, you know what I'm doing? I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. Is it going to be spiritual enough? Is it going to be appropriate or foolish? I don't want to be thinking these thoughts but they're just in me when I'm supposed to be praying. So Jesus gives us an alternate strategy. In verse 6, he says, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So if we're really honest, prayer is hard for us, well, at least for me, because I think we think if we are not moving, if we are not achieving visible progress, Nothing is happening. And this starts really early in life. Um, I've been in a Zoom class all week long, um, a seminary class on the history of the Evangelical Covenant Church. Feel sorry for me right now. (laughs) Um, And I haven't taken a class in over 20 years. And 20 years ago, we did not have Zoom, just so you know. Um, I don't even think we had the internet. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, though. This has been a whole new experience for me. But at the end of the class, all the post-work assignments, there will be a grade given, hopefully a good grade, hopefully a positive, measurable end to all the hard work put in, right? Prayer often feels like we got an I, we got an incomplete, and we're just sitting 
at a red light and nothing is happening, visually at least. And sometimes you pray and you don't get what you want. And that's a barrier. And Jesus knows this about us. Prayer is a process of remembering that the unseen is more real than what is seen or what can be measured. Jesus continues with some more warnings in verse 7. He says, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many, many words. Sometimes we think that prayer is just superstitious. Um, In an old Charlie Brown cartoon, I love this guy, Linus. Do you remember Linus? This is a quote from him. He said, I made an interesting theological discovery. When you pray with your hands folded upside down, you get the opposite of what you pray for. And some of you are thinking, I've been doing this wrong all along. In Jesus' day, the pagans did not realize that prayer to the God of Israel was actually intellectual, thoughtful conversation about what we are doing together. That's prayer in the Bible. Prayer helps us reorient our whole life towards the unseen kingdom of God rather than our present surroundings. So Jesus gives these warnings, and then he jumps in and he gives us the best gift, the grandest and most repeated prayer. Getting advice from Jesus on prayer is like getting advice from Warren Buffett on how to invest. My friends, why wouldn't we take this advice? Yes? So over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at each phrase in the Lord's Prayer and taking a deeper dive into the understanding of Jesus' direction to us when we pray. And I really do encourage all of us, as we lead up to Advent, to pray the Lord's Prayer every day. Morning, night, it doesn't matter when, but what does matter is instead of going through a rote words that you've memorized and quickly running through the creed or the prayer, stop and sit in and really absorb and meditate on each word in the Lord's Prayer. These can be moments of spiritual life transformation, not just checking it off your list. I had a piano teacher my first few years in college. Her name was Miss Bridgman, and she would give me an assignment, and then I would come, I'd work so hard on this piece, and I would show up at the lesson, and the first measure, I would play one or two or three notes, and she would stop me every single week. I'm like, what? I'm never going to get through a song. And she would say this, think about what you are playing, Leanne, how you are playing it. It's not just notes. This is an expression of your heart through music. So our lessons were extremely long, and we rarely got through an entire piano piece, but those first few measures were really good, just so you know. This morning, with some patience and some pauses, we're going to walk together through the first eight words of the Lord's Prayer. And just like Miss Bridgman, I'm going to stop us, I'm going to pause us along the way so we can get the vast richness and the depth of meaning out of every single word. Let's start with the very first two, our Father. Say our Father. Now this reminds us that prayer is not the same as worrying out loud. Prayer is my thinking through in conversation with God, which means I have to address God, right? So when I send an email or I call you, I don't just say, hey, you. I usually use a name. And if you're really close to someone, sometimes you have a a term of endearment that you use rather than their known name. Um, When a grandchild is born, everybody gets a new name, right? My mom and dad have become known as Nana and Papa, thanks to Bella Jewel. Those are her terms of endearment for my parents. Now, Jesus says the same thing. He says, here's the name change. We are going to call the creator and the judge of all things our Father. And if you back up, the whole gospel is actually wrapped up in that first word, our. God is not just the Father of Jesus. He is not. He, we have a heavenly Father who made us, who loves us, and who watches over us. When I pray our Father, I remember that I am special, but I am not more special than anyone else. Every single human being I see is loved by the Father heart of God. Every single human being we see every day is loved by the Father heart of God. Mother Teresa talked about seeing Jesus in everyone. I have a ministry friend from California, Jeremy, and he often said, it's not me and God, it's we and God. This is a family of faith. It's all of us together. 
So we say, our Father in heaven. Say, in heaven. Jesus is saying this is actually translated plural, not singular. So it's actually translated, our Father in the heavens. It's plural for a reason. In the ancient world, they thought of heavens as three different levels. And Pastor Bruce Ewing, I don't know if he's here this morning, but he told me about a book he was reading from, by G. Campbell Morgan on the topic of prayer. It's called The Practice of Prayer, and it was written in the early 1900s. And in this book, they use this diagram that they're going to put up that shows the different levels of the heavens that they understood in the ancient world. The third heaven was where the saints and the seraphim and the angels live. The second heaven was where the stars and the moon abide. And then there was the first heaven. See that dot? That's where the sparrows live. And Jesus in Matthew 10, 29 has this beautiful conversation about the birds. And he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Morgan points out that the father not only sees the sparrow fall, but he holds him as he dies. Even the bird dies in the company of God. So when we pray, our Father in heaven, we are saying, our Father, who is closer than the air, I breathe. When you pray, don't think about God far, far away. No, he is as close as the air that's going in and out of your lungs right now. That's where God is, right here, right now. A quote from the book from Morgan was, Thus, as I begin to pray according to the pattern which the Lord gives me, I find at the portal of my prayer a doctrine of God, which assures me that nothing is beyond his reach, and nothing is too small for his presence or his attention. Oh, the infinite comfort of it. I've told many of you, um, I did a dissertation on the essence of Christian worship, and I sat and I listened to people's stories about when they felt closest to God. And a common shared experience was sitting at the bedside of a loved one who was passing from this life to the next. And they said how close they felt to God in that moment. God is present with us in all the circumstances of our life. But he is as close as the air that we breathe, even when we take our last. That's our Father in heaven. So let's review real quickly. Our is with whom we pray, all of us. Father is to whom we pray. In the heavens is where he is, omnipresent, all around us, as close as the air we breathe. And we come to this passage, hallowed be your name. This is why we pray. Say, hallowed be your name. I'm going to spend some time on this few points of reflection on this portal into prayer, as Morgan would say. Number one, God is worthy of our praise. And what that means is, God, may your reputation be greatly enhanced here on earth. May people come to realize how wonderful, how beautiful you are. May you be adored. May you be worshiped and praised. As a worship pastor, I often get this question, why does God want us to praise him all the time? Is he some kind of cosmic narcissist? Yes, I do get this question. And it's very important to understand the answer. Worship is not something we do to boost God's self-esteem. He doesn't need that. C.S. Lewis writes about this quite a bit. When we see something that we love, we naturally desire to praise it. In fact, the act of praising doesn't just express our joy. It is a part of our joy. And a part of our joy is expressing wonder. Imagine this, the frustration you would experience if you saw your favorite team win a championship, but you were not allowed to cheer. Now stop for just a moment. Uh, really imagine this. 100,000 people in the stadium, right? The team scores. Probably not OU. But the team scores. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I had to throw that in because you're in the room. And what happens? There's silence, right? No way. No way. That's never going to happen. Why? Because the win evokes a response. You cannot keep quiet. When we see something, when we see someone who is worthy of praise, part of our joy is being able to praise it. All enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. 
Thanksgiving and praise is actually the highest form of thought. The worst moment for an atheist is when they realize how thankful they are for their life and they have no one to thank. We were created to praise our God. That's who we are made to do. What's what we were made to do? We were made to praise, and that is why we say, hallowed be your name. This is our why. This is our why when we walk into this room, and it continues to be our why when we walk out into our daily lives. Number two, prayer and praise changes us. Now, I have to get in my friend John Ortberg quote for the day. He says, when God is fully cherished, the heart is fully healthy, and the soul is fully whole. Now, notice the order of what is first. When God is fully cherished, then all these things, right? In Matthew 6, Jesus said it this way, seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added as well. He's teaching us to focus on God and not us. In fact, the first three requests of the Lord's Prayer are not focused on us, but they're focused on God. The importance of order matters because the beginning of this prayer helps us prioritize our lives. And then our prayer requests change, right? As we truly worship God, order matters. Number three, prayer and praise go together. So we start out with our prayer, our Father in heaven, and now we experience the beauty and the power of acknowledging the name above all names. Hallowed be thy name. Praise is a portal into prayer. As quoted by Morgan, we lift up the name of God. Now Jesus says we are to hallow his name. And that means just to set apart, to dedicate, to consecrate, to exalt. In the worship guide this morning, if you're using it, there's a link to a document that talks about all the names of Jehovah. And I just want this to be a resource for you. Um, you can use it. This is not extensive, but here's some names, and they're so tiny. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read three. Jehovah Elyon, the Lord Most High. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord Our Provider. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord Our Banner. This is a good start, right? If you struggle with how to begin the portion of the Lord's Prayer, simply do this. Pray, pause, and praise. Say that. Pray, pause, and praise. Praising our God using the scriptural scaffolding that is given to us in the Bible. We see the character of God and the nature of our Lord jumping off the page, but we rarely use it in prayer. So I challenge you, if you get through that whole list of Jehovah names, the Lord our God, then let's focus on his majesty for a second. Psalm 8, Lord our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Or we can focus on God's glory. Psalm 27, 72, sorry, praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Let's focus on his greatness for a second. Psalm 145, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, his greatness no one can fathom. Now, I love to focus on God's goodness. We sang about it this morning. Um, 1 Chronicles 16 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is, say it, good, for his mercy endures forever. Or we can talk about Psalm 27. It says, I would have lost heart. I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Or we can talk about Psalm 33. His love, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the what? The goodness of our Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. I mean, this is just a few scriptures on the goodness of God. And we can go on and on talking about the many attributes of our heavenly Father. But I challenge you, I challenge us to add scripture to this daily prayer. And as you begin to pray and pause and truly hallowed be your name, just spend some time doing that, lifting up his name for who he is. Prayer and praise go together as we acknowledge who God is. Does that make sense? Let's do that this week. Number four, prayer and praise is a form of evangelism. 
Now, in the 90s, there was this big debate in the evangelical world between seeker-friendly and believer-based services. Does anybody remember this debate, or is it just me? I was a child, right? Very young. Um, but the Chicago church in uh, uh, Willow Creek was focusing on seeker-sensitive services. They would start with secular music, right? And they would do like a skit or a play to make the gospel a little bit more palatable for the unbeliever. And this, this was very successful. In fact, there's churches today that still follow this mod- model. I had the privilege in the 90s of meeting Sally Morgenthaler, who wrote this bombshell book in 1995 entitled Worship Evangelism, Inviting Unbelievers into the Presence of God. And at the time, this was radical. It was countercultural what was happening in the church. Um, Dr. Robert Weber wrote this on the back of her book. He said this, Worship evangelism strikes at the heart of a very important issue. Evangelism does not have to be severed from worship, as though there is no relationship between the two. True worship is characterized by converting power. Say converting power. What the ancient church called real presence, what the contemporary church calls manifest presence, that presence is not a gimmick but a result of faithfulness to a worship informed by biblical principles, historical liturgy, and the intimacy of the contemporary. Now, if I lost you at worship evangelism, come back to me for a minute. Are we talking about prayer, you may ask? Well, yes, we actually are. Remember what I said, pauses and patience. Ms. Bridgman would say this. The whole mission of the church, the whole mission is wrapped up in that word, our, the whole gospel. Prayer is not just something that we rush through. It is supernatural. There is supernatural power in prayer. When we pray, when we pause, and when we praise, there is power. And that power transforms us and in turn transforms the world around us, our circle of influence. Prajakta David came a few weeks ago. She's the Director of Global Advancement and Mobilization for our denomination, and Adam interviewed her, and this caught my attention, what she said about worship and evangelism. In the life of the church, I truly believe that mission and worship are interdependent on each other. We worship God when we engage and participate in God's global mission by loving our neighbor well. It's a part of worship, right? Two weeks ago, Dr. Dave Kirsten came, and he talked on the three touchstones of the Evangelical Covenant Church, Do you remember number three? Yes, this is a test. I've been in a Zoom class all week. What was it? Anybody remember? Number three is God's glory. That's cheating. Adam knows all of it. God's glory, neighbor's good. Say God's glory, neighbor's good. There is an overflow out of our worship that changes us and it draws people to Christ starting with our neighbor, starting with our circle of influence. When we live, while we live on this earth, one of the joys and one of the responsibilities of being a Christ follower is to magnify, to set apart, to consecrate the name of our Lord in the sanctuary, on our job, and all around our our acquaintances and our family members that we meet every day, to love God well and to love our neighbor too. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 5, 5, 16. He says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and, what did they do? Glorify your Father in heaven. Now to many, Jesus may seem far away. He may seem unseen. But as we begin to understand how to do this very simple thing, pray, pause, and praise, We are changed, and that changes our atmosphere. That changes everything around us. We bring the power of God, the unseen power of God, into the seen realm when we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Now, this is just the first eight words. Can you believe that? I think Adam or Dave is going to take the next 12, so I don't know how many points you're going to have. I said this morning, Dave's going to have three points, I'm sure. This is a fun dive, not just to understand it, but to practice it. So just as a review, let's say each word out loud. Let's start with our, not just me and God, 
but we in God. The whole gospel is wrapped up in that one word. Say, Father, he is the creator and judge of all things, but he asks us to call him Dad. In heaven, he is with us. He is as close as the air that you are breathing right now. Hallowed, set apart, dedicated, consecrated, exalted. Be your name. We will lift up the name of Jesus above all names. That is mission accomplished as we recognize God's glory overflowing for our neighbor's good. Let's say the whole thing together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Amen. Now we're going to spend a few moments responding and putting prayer into practice. But did you know that we don't just say prayers? We sing prayers. So this morning, go ahead and stand, and we're going to sing a closing response. What a beautiful name.